How you doing? I'm Jim Groom. This is Reclaim Today. And I am here with a special guest, Mark Kozitka. Is that the right pronunciation, Mark? That, is, do that you is correct. Thick, thick Polish last name. You bet, sir. Exactly. Mark, welcome to Reclaim Today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a kind of funny story how we met, right? Um, I don't know if you want to tell it, but... Um, <laughs> feel free. Yeah, if not, I'll fill in any details. You no, know, you know, certainly you can you can gladly fill in the gaps as we as we uh, as we move through here. Um, but uh, we first had some sort of engagement through um, Georgetown's uh, graduate school uh, for learning design and technology. And that's that's kind of how we first had our initiation, I suppose, uh, together. But after I've uh, went through the program and had to had to build an online uh, an online presence for myself, digital identity through uh, through domains of one's own. Um, with Georgetown University, uh, then I had to move my move my space uh, to to reclaim hosting. That was um, uh, Jim and, and those folks have great ties with Georgetown. Uh, so moving that space relatively quickly after graduation might even be might even be have been before I graduated because I found it as a you know necessity to have this space for for myself for jobs and things like that and, and promoting myself online uh etc and uh, and recently i would say probably a couple months ago um i was uh, i was getting notifications about uh, certain ip addresses trying to hack into uh in, <laughs> into my domain uh and uh so i started i started sending some messages to reclaim hosting and and jim was always very quick to respond and i explained hey you know i'm a former georgetown student and uh and he's very well connected with, with those folks there and we got to chatting and he was constantly consoling me about this you know me me freaking out about you know some hungarian company trying to you know get into my website and uh and kind of the safeguards there were you know were in place and and because they were you know in place and, and doing their job that made me kind of freak out because uh, i didn't know that that was that was part of the process uh so j so uh, excuse me jim kept on um you know, coming back to me, Mark. This this is a really good sign that that this thing is happening, and he, you know, he provided some comfort and you know additional levels of security uh, and things like that. So we got to talking, you know, kind of about the role of this project into you know into my career, what I do now, and how I got here. And I didn't even charge you extra for the calming therapy, right? I, it was <laughs> yeah, all on the was, house. Yep, yeah, I you know I was uh, I was laying down in, in a <laughs> chair with my with my laptop, you know, going through this breathing heavily. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's really how it's, this it's, level of engagement. Yeah, it's funny too. And so, like one of the things the the issue you're talking about was directly linked to a plugin for WordPress, limit logins, which basically is a plugin that we automatically install and it activates you know, basically lock certain IPs out if they try and log into your site too many times. And what happened is the plugin changed the way in which they notify the user. And that's why everyone started getting these emails because, you know, people are trying to hack WordPress all the time. It's not <laughs> anything new. It's just the fact that now you can see it. Yeah, like it's all like, yeah, you, you don't, you'd stop eating basically hot dogs once you realize what's in them. It's the same idea. <laughs> once you realize how vulnerable the web is, you you rethink your life. But well, it well, and the fact too that, as as you said, like these, you know, these things are automated as well. So it's not like you know, perhaps an individual person is constantly trying to trying to get into you know certain spaces of mind. It's it's an automated process. So these things are kind of running on the clock. So now I I kind of expect about every two or three weeks, I'm going to get about three emails, you know, about, uh, about an IP address uh, from someplace in Hungary. So um, it's a uh, it's been you, pretty pretty routine. You can turn those off. See, this is like this is like live therapy yeah. right now. On <laughs> yeah. You can turn them off. Don't worry, Mark. Go back to sleep. <laughs> just, just relax. Yeah, <laughs> get, get, get pinged at like three in the morning, but uh, it's working, as as you said. So that but, that really brought us uh, brought us together and started exchanging some ideas. It was cool for me, Mark, to see that a. So, like you said, you went through that very unique graduate program at Georgetown University, where they're basically you know, integrating learning design, educational technology, and broader ideas of the discipline, and kind of reframing it around scholarship and Lee Scalarup, um, Eddie Maloney, I think Brian Alexander is teaching there now. I mean, it's quite a program um, and a lot of great people. So it's interesting to see that you're alumnus of that. Um, and also, like, you took your domain with you, which is where we started talking, because when I was chatting with you, you're like, yeah, I really dig it because it helped me make the next move in my career uh, to Penn State. So do you want to say anything about that? Like, obviously, 
that for me is intriguing because stories like that for anybody who's thinking through demand of one's own faculty students is always you know valuable yeah well and i you know in the age that we live in even obviously pre-pandemic um you know your digital presence you know depending on the industry that that you're applying to is is something most you know most industries look at even beyond kind of like the the social media aspect of things they want to see you know who you are uh, and how you present yourself probably more accurately um, online and you know and even if you don't present them this stuff they might very well look for themselves anyways so I used I used domain of one own one as a necessity as it, as it was again part of the part of my Georgetown program. Uh, it was kind of our capstone project, um, kind of in place of a dissertation, if you will, um, for that. So it was a necessity that, that I had to get it done, but I, I converted that then into, you know, really a platform to, to sell myself to, you know, uh, for jobs and things like that. And so as part of my application process to my, to my current role at Penn State, which I do work in an IT space. I work in IT learning and development as a team lead here. Um, that I presented this as as part of my as part of my application, uh, and went through uh, had a had a meeting similar to this, um, though obviously a little little more, little more formal. Um, that I, I took them through my website, and, and in that website, you know, I had you know I had kind of the details of the resume. I had one page just specifically designed for my resume, and even within my resume, I you know I kind of you know made it very efficient in terms of an economical in terms of what I was presenting uh, but then other other spaces you know where I had a, I had a page that was that was broken down into areas of, of research and projects and you know so then within within that page uh, users could then kind of oh well if he's here's his work on policy and here's you know his here's his you know kind of sampling of of how he can write and articulate policy and create those kind of argumentative um, and supportive documents and here's here's a here's a sec or here's a here's a segment where he goes over presentations so you can kind of see some powerpoints and here's here's a report um, like a lengthy a horizon report that I had to, that I had to craft up which also showed not only my ability to write but kind of creativity with images and things like yeah. that so I used it as you know really as kind of the uh, you know the um, you know an enticer so to speak and supportive of what I'm saying hey not only am I saying these things look what I've done now, would you say that those, all of those kind of different projects and policy documents or things you created, were they part of what you did as part of the master's program at Georgetown? So did you take all your distributed work and kind of create it as a cohesive kind of space for people to get a sense of, here's the work I've done, here's demonstrating the way I've narrated my process as a student. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, most of it, um as I presented it to Georgetown, um, I only kept and I curated the, you know, the projects and things that I worked on within that capacity as a, as a Georgetown graduate student, um, because that was, you know, that was, that was part of the, you know, the whole kind of end game of this, of this domains within that context. After graduating, you know, and when I asked, you know, the, the folks that's, you know, my professors and stuff, Hey, you know, after I graduate, you know, what 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 could this potentially look like? And so then I brought in other work that I've previously done from other jobs, you know, other education, you know, that, that I that I've had, uh, and added that into into this as well. So then it kind of became a, a wider breadth of of my work, and you know, showing showing different um, skills uh, and kind of traversing different industries, whether it be education, business analytics, things like that. So all that kind of became, you know, part of part of my narrative. But Jim, you you bring up a, an interesting point here too, you know, about hey, well, what what to include? Well, as a Georgetown student, obviously including those things, but even within those parameters, yeah. you know, I had to become very cognizant of well, what narrative. Do I want to represent or do I want to, you know, showcase based on these projects? In other words, what do I keep and what do I leave out? And I think, yeah. you know, what you leave out is almost as important, if not more important than what than what you put in. Uh, and that's that's really part of the, you know, the you know the curating process of of your work, and it makes you know force me to be very self reflective, you know, on this stuff. And even though I may have thought one particular document or project you know, showcase, you know, great potential or, you know, some kind of skills that others may not. However, it didn't necessarily fit into the narrative 
that I that I was that I was creating, you know, for an objective goal, i.e., get a certain job, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a very it was a very interesting, you know, kind of meta experience that you know, yeah. and just being you know forcing you to be self aware. A couple of things on that point, and that's you know that really is you, you explain that quite well. And a couple of things it makes me think of is one. You know, obviously, it truly does become a domain of one's own when you take it over. You start paying it and see value in it. But then it's not just about your coursework. It's about work you've done as part of your career as a life and as you're learning and different jobs. And that's really cool to hear because I think that jump between it's a place to put coursework, it's a repository, to it's an actually living thing that's narrating my kind of story the way I want folks to read it is super important. And that whole idea of, you know, a narrative theory to the web and to that sense of digital identity is super important, right? Because we've seen that across various social media and the implications of how you tell stories, you know, how you check the narrative of that story, how you frame that story it becomes a very powerful act. And I think it's one that actually universities need to invest in and thinking through how, you know, they not only tell their own story, but encourage and, you know, I don't know, enforce is the wrong word, I think, encourage or really kind of encourage, let's keep it there, encourage students to really, like, take some ownership of the work they're doing, and to narrate that more publicly. And I think curating that is important, but also, like, just having the space and the, the mindset to do it is, you know, really powerful, I think, well, as you're making the argument. Well, and we were, you know, we were blessed, you know, as, as students at, at, at Georgetown um, before uh, before we kind of got on got on this, you know, uh, platform here, you and I were talking about, you know, the professors and stuff, you know, that, that, that we have there. And every single one of them had, you know, was was a piece, you know, was a piece in that in that kind of learning experience and that and that learning puzzle, which you know is reflected, you know, in you know in my in my domain in, in some in some respects. So you know, not only work from these individual professors, but you know their their encouragement about about certain story and you know and you know and what what I really wanted to, really wanted to do with that particular space. Um, but above but above all, it was this idea of. Of teaching, you know, teaching us and encouraging that that empowerment and that and that self reflection, uh, which has become which has become very 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 important. And you know, would would my you know would my space look the way that it does now had I not been a part of that experience? I could safely say it wouldn't. You know, um, so there was a there was a great environmental factor, you know, and, and learning curve around that. Now, do you do you Google yourself? Is that something you do? Like where you put your name in, and then you see what comes up. I, I I have done that. I have done that in the past, and um and one of the things that I you know because I used to be on all uh, all different you know shapes and forms of of social media, uh, which I haven't been on in in a very long time now. I kind of you know because you start say, type, typing in your name, you know, if you have an Instagram account that comes up, and and all these other things, and I and I realize that you know this kind of plays on you know, this idea of, of cultural identity that. You know, you can only do, you can only, you know, tell certain stories or, or what have you based on the limitations or restrictions of certain platforms. And so part of that, you know, kind of creation of, of who you are online, I wanted that to be focused on my one, my, the two things, my, my domain uh, and also my LinkedIn, because those are, those are two, you know, to, you know, somewhat, you know, LinkedIn's obviously, you know, professional network, you know, type type platform. And I use kind of my my domain as as a combination of that of that kind of professionalism, but also um, you know, it, you get the opportunity to be as creative as you as you see fit. So you've got a little more control over uh, over kind of the narrative arc and how you're presenting, you know, yourself in that space. You know, you got the plugins, you got all these all these different ways to you know, to kind of express yourself in, you know, uh, on your, on your personal page. But again, my, my goal was to keep, keep that kind of professional narrative as well. And, and part of that was, Hey, if I'm Googling myself and I'm seeing, you know, my Instagram and all this stuff, which, which frankly is, you know, it's part of me, but it's, it's a different narrative. One of the ways to kind of focus my digital presence would be to eliminate those things. And, uh, which I, which I certainly did. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, the idea that, you know, being spread across all these different platforms, I find personally, like, there are some platforms I use that are far more personal and some that are far more professional. But like the blog for me, which is what I do, I blog, is the record, right? Like that's the authoritative record of my thinking, of the projects I'm doing, of the things. If anyone wanted to have a real sense of uh, what that is. But the thing about all these different platforms and the way the web works now is identity is fairly balkanized, right? It's across different platforms. It's owned by different groups, right? And they see you. It's interesting who, how one platform sees me versus another, given the ads they send me. And it's like a really interesting kind of idea that these platforms are doing everything they can to understand this sense of identity with, with you know, I mean, it's not, it's not a surprise, but the idea of, you know, being able to target you for advertisements. And that's a really interesting notion of this idea of not only the limits of those platforms, but also the way in which they template you into a self, right? Like it's the templated space that really frames the yeah. idea of a self online. And you kind of become a product, your, or your identity, you know, more accurately becomes becomes a product of those environments, and which I find, you know, so so fascinating, and also potentially, you know, kind of kind of disturbing as well. So, you know, and you, there's also that element too of of what others may say or you know or document about you you know, on these other platforms. So, you know, I, you know, IE someone taking a picture, putting me up on, you know, on this thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that kind of cultural identity, I mean, it encompasses a lot and kind of one of my, one of my goals and, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, using my domain and, you know, and LinkedIn and, and those sort, sorts of things, like, what do I have control over? And, and in what ways, you know, do I want to utilize that that control to, you know, uh, you know, to create to create a story that that I want to that I'm proud of and that, that I want to display, but also with the understanding and realization and being cognizant of there will be restrictions, you know, based on what I can and can't do, um, and based on you know what's you know what others and outside factors that I have no control over, you know, that all kind of factors into to that. To that identity, um, so it's a it's a very it's a very fascinating time that you know that we live in, especially now you know kind of intra or or post pandemic too. Like you know the the necessity of, of having that presence, but being cognizant of all those different pieces that make this that make up this collective. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I was thinking. Obviously, we're in the we're in the the industry of educational technology, which has had a particular kind of pressure on it these days, given the pandemic. But like, it's interesting to me as things go online or hybrid or we reimagine it. And I know Penn State has done amazing stuff online for a long time with World Campus. But I had the wild experience before this meeting and for this discussion of going into a Chipotle to try and get lunch because I'm traveling right now. I'm not at home, so I'm kind of have to go and forage where I can. And Chipotle said, online orders only. Like, you could only get anything from us in this physical store online. And it made me think about, like, obviously, online learning and the moment in which all of this kind of has changed a whole field's perspective of itself and what's possible. And, like, there is a sense that we'll return to normal in the vaccine. And I hope that's true, but I think there will always be the shift now as a result of what we have needed to do and what we've learned from it and what <laughs> limits were in place and how do we truly support it. But I, I think it's a super interesting moment. But to your point, on top of everything is that as part of this process when we move to digital, how can we not only help reinforce the notion of a certain amount of control over this space, certain amount of protection, but also a certain amount of like humanity, right? A space where we can contact and and like really be in connection and not necessarily broadcasting as a lot of the social media networks have turned into, but a sense of real connection and a, a relationship. And I think that's still the kind of uh, holy grail that an educational technologist is seeking. And identity, I firmly believe, is so is so integral to that because I think when you go to university, at least for me, and I can't speak for everyone, 
a lot of that is highly identity forming. You know, like your tastes, your notions of yourself, your relationships with others, the decisions you make of what you want to focus on and study. Like all of these inform who you are as a person for a good part of the rest of your life. And like, how is that kind of almost like cauldron working to create this sense of an identity as part of an intellectual and social pursuit? It's super interesting to me. Well, and and I think a lot of that too is, you know, being cognizant of like, it, it can change, that product can change. So when we, you know, create, you know, uh, these different things, you know, um, online, you know, be domains and, and things like that. It's not, it's not, it's not set in stone. Like we do have control over, over changing that narrative uh, as well. And, you know, and, and knowing when, when to do that and, you know, and being self-reflective and self-aware, you know, of that. But, you know, I, I think you're entirely right, regardless of, you know, of how this whole pandemic plays out, you know, it, it, it has changed education in, you know, in the sense of, of what's possible. And, you know, and, you know, if we were to, you know, encounter something like this, like this ever again, to have that, to, you know, essentially have that, you know, new formation of, of an infrastructure that's, you know, that, that allows, you know, kind of more, more of a seamless transition to, you know, to these spaces. So I think there's, there's some interesting silver linings to, um, to what has happened, especially in the educational space. And it's also pointing out, you know, some other very, very, you know, um, important things, you know, equity, equality, all these, all these other things, you know, they're, they're even more heightened, you know, because of, you know, because of this and, you know, and, and it does kind of point to, you know, these digital spaces and, uh, and it's, as you said, it all kind of works together and, and thrown into, thrown into the same pot and, you know, and what we learn from that and, you know, and, and, and how do we, how do we handle that, you know, not only, you know, in the present, but, but moving forward. Well, you know what? I can't say it better. I think that's a great place for us to wrap up and kind of, A, thank you for your time, Mark, to come on and chat about your experience with domains at Georgetown and how that's kind of, you know, begun the start of something beautiful at Penn State. And uh, we'll see where that goes from there. But thanks again for yeah, agreeing I, to talk I, to me. I, 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 I appreciate, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, this was, uh, this was something, something unexpected. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, started from pretty interesting circumstance, I, I, I suppose. So, uh, and it's also, you know, great to, you know, talk with, you know, and, and present my, my ideas about this and just to talk about my experience, you know, with Georgetown and, and these spaces. So it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And it's nice to see someone new, you know, other than, yeah. you know, the folks and students and stuff I deal with at Penn State. So anytime I can, uh, I can chat with other folks, it's, it's fantastic. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks again. And uh, Reclaim Today episode, who knows? I don't know what number this is. I think it's in the 30s. <laughs> Just signing out. Trace, bye trace bye. the or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Bye-bye.